Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whatever your time zone may be. Thank you for joining us today for another for another exciting Power BI Turkey user group meetup. Uh, together uh, today we are together with Chris Webb and Peter Myers. Uh, they will take us through the fine details of Power BI datasets. Uh, first up, uh, a bit of housekeeping. Q and A is open. You are more than welcome to put your questions into the chat window, or you can ask directly by unmuting yourself. Uh, also, the session is being recorded and will be online a week later on uh, on our YouTube channel. I will paste the link into the chat window. Hi, Chris. Hi, Peter. Thanks a lot for joining me today. It's great having you both at the same meetup. Uh, I had the pleasure of hosting each of you at different meetups uh, previously today, but today I feel like I'm double privileged. <coughs> Okay, thank you uh, for having us. Without further ado, I'm handing over to you. All right, is now a good time for me to share the desktop? Okay. Okay, let, let us know when you can see the title slide. Okay. Awesome. All right, well, look, uh, thank you very much for having us uh, speak with you this evening. Uh, and so it's a welcome to this presentation uh, on demystifying Power BI datasets. So Chris Webb, and we'll introduce um, ourselves in just a moment. We put this presentation together because we found that there were so many terms related to Power BI datasets um, that there was a great deal of confusion. And so the main uh, purpose of putting this presentation together was to help remove confusion. And so what we found is that the service has undergone enormous change and growth over the past five years. And so we want to uh, deliver to you a nice session of more than, I don't know, we started with 50 terms, didn't we, Chris? And um, we want to work through those together in this uh, presentation, time permitting. So there are 50, but uh, according to the time we have, we might get through a, a reasonable chunk of those. So <laughs> welcome. My name is Peter Myers. Um, coming from Melbourne, Australia, it's 3 a.m. here this morning uh, on your tomorrow. And I'm a data platform MVP of uh, now 14 and a bit years. I've just been renewed on the 1st of July. And uh, my focus is on the data platform with a specialty on business intelligence. And my name is Chris Webb. I work at Microsoft on the Power BI team uh, as part of the Power BI customer advisory team. Um, I've been around using Microsoft BI tools for a, a long, long time, uh, both inside and outside Microsoft. And um, please read my blog and follow my social media. Uh, and um, yeah, we'll, uh, uh, my main role in this presentation, I think, today is to make sure Peter doesn't go for those 52 set terms. We get down to a, <laughs> something, something a bit more reasonable. <laughs> and, and and to keep me honest. So thanks for the introduction. Um, I've just dropped a uh, URL into the web browser because what we'd like you to do is also introduce who you are. So um, it's pretty standard in a presentation that I give that um, we put up a dashboard here and if you can click on the link in the chat window or use the tiny URL here or the QR code um, if you're watching this on a recording probably not a great idea to attempt to join this real-time survey but let's get a feel for who you are um, what your backgrounds are in Power BI what your role is and um, perhaps what your important topic for today's presentation could be I submitted. <laughs> ah, the results are We're coming in already. <laughs> Good. You know, when you're presenting to a virtual audience, it's just not the same, is it, Chris? It's like. Yeah, exactly. You never know who's there, really, or who's paying attention. Or if anybody's there, you know, it'd be. Yeah. It'd be well, at least you can see itself. Halil's paying attention. So Chris and I presented this several times together. In fact, we put it together originally as a Microsoft webinar, and we'll share that link with you if you would like to watch the original recording. But I'm going to say that this presentation has matured um, considerably since we first put it together some months ago. Um, it's been improved incrementally uh, presentation by presentation. Um, the reason I say this is that next week we're presenting it to my home city of Melbourne, and um, I've just been told yesterday uh, it's an in-person event. I'm like, I'm in shock. What's an in-person event? It's been <laughs> so long. 
All right. What sense can we make of this, Chris? Well, the venue changes, but the numbers don't really change, do they? <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit younger here, I think, in Istanbul. <laughs> it is. I'm going to say that. And, and actually a better gender split that I've seen in, um, in a while. Mm. So that's good to see as well. Um, our focus is less on details about your age or your gender. Um, I include those in the survey, and it's a standard survey because sometimes I present on um, machine learning topics. So it's nice sometimes to use that data set. But what we're really focusing on is, well, what role are you in? And I'm happy to see, I'm squinting because I took my glasses off, BI developer and business analyst are the top two, which is the target audience for this presentation, right, Chris? Mm -hmm. So speaking about data sets, you know, we're focused on you guys that are data modelers and are presenting uh, or producing these models and publishing them as data sets. Uh, with a glance at the Power BI experience, um, anywhere from zero through to, it looks like we have the one ninja at number nine. So welcome to the beginner. Um, we will be beginning at beginner pitch about the fundamentals of data sets, but we will be ramping up into more advanced and complex topics. So do stay tuned for the whole presentation. With a quick drill through, um, we can see that the important topic that you've asked us to present on today. Everybody, everybody always wants optimization, don't they? Will we be covering the any optimization? Part, really? It's the fun part, but then we see fundamentals. So um, coming in as a, as a second and a strong contender. So that's really where we're going to kick off in just a moment. What is a data set? And uh, let's dispel any common misconceptions. Uh, Real-time analytics, we'll talk about them very briefly. And oh, there's someone that really wants to know about governance, great. Um, ordinarily, we have someone, at least one person, say supermodels was uh, something they would like us to talk about. <laughs> Chris, are we going to talk about supermodels? Well, it depends on what you mean by a supermodel, doesn't it? Um, we will not be talking about Claudia Schiffer. We will be talking about um, super power BI models. Uh, or I Which know, are far more super glamorous. models right, to Chris? you and I. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Gets so me thanks excited. Thanks for participating in that survey. Um, well, let's get into it. So over 50 terms related to data sets, the obvious starting point is to begin with the fundamentals themselves. So Chris, over to you. Okay, so the absolute most important core term that we'll be talking about in this session is the data set. The data set is the center of the universe as far as Power BI is concerned. It's the artifact within Power BI that is the source of your data. It's stored in a workspace. Uh, it can be accessed from lots of different places across workspaces. But every time you've got a Power BI report, you'll have to have some kind of data set, at least. So let's uh, give you an example of a data set, right? So here in Workspace A, a data set that supports two reports and a dashboard. That's pretty straightforward. But what happens when we have a second data set or a second workspace? And uh, it has a data set and a report um, that's perfectly reasonable. But look at this. Reports and data dashboards can use data sets from any workspace. Um, so the takeaway there is that as that primary artifact that drives the data visualizations of Power BI, um, these resources can be accessed across workspaces. Um, so the fact is, if you have permission to access the data set, um, then you will find it inside what we now call the data sets hub in the Power BI service. Where is that found, Chris? Um, you can find, you can navigate to it from the Power BI homepage now. Uh, and there's a link to it directly from the, yes, yeah, so there's a link to it from um, one of the icons along the, the left-hand side of the homepage. It only appeared right. in December. So the, uh, I cannot remember what the icon is exactly. Um, let me, I, of course, of course, uh, I have, uh, it is the little database icon that it mm, takes you I to think the we data see it. We icon. see it here. We see the orange version of it here. So exactly. that, that icon generally represents a relational database, but it becomes the standard icon for a data set. Um, so there's the most fundamental thing. Power BI as a data visualization service is nothing without data. And so the data set really is the driving artifact. But wait, Chris, our 
fabulous furry friend paginated report bearer has got a, a point here. But what about paginated reports? All right. So this is the point where I'm the guy from Microsoft who has to come and apologize because <laughs> we always we always screw things up with naming. And the fact is that in Power BI, there are now two things called data sets. We have the data sets that we are talking about in this session, but we also have things called data sets inside paginated reports. The reason is that paginated reports are really the cloud-based version of SQL Server reporting services reports. And in SQL Server reporting services, we had a thing called a data set, um, which was similar, but not the same as what we have in Power BI. Now we have SSRS reports inside Power BI as paginated reports. We have the concept of data sets there, but they are not the same thing as Power BI data sets. And if you're confused, I'm not surprised. I'm sorry, but um, we are not going to be talking about data sets in the paginated reports sense of the word here. We are talking about Power BI data sets. Indeed. And and while Chris has been speaking, I realized that I didn't put subtitles on. And Halil, is that something that's going to help the audience? Um, because uh, uh, I don't think so, Peter. So, so I'm, I'm going to put, put them on anyway, anyway because I'm okay. fascinated by the accuracy and how they, they're so cool. So um, I put it on if that's okay. And Chris, to Chris's point, he's just explained that we've got this second term for data set. Do not confuse data set in the Power BI paginated reports with what we're talking about in the Power BI service. They are different things. And to make things really confusing, did you know in a paginated report, you can connect a data source to a data set, and then in the paginated report, you can create a data set. So um, what we're saying now is forget about this concept as important as it is, because everything we focus on is the Power BI data set. All right, we also have the concept of a data model. Now, a data set is a real thing. You can go into the Power BI service and you can see something listed as a data set. But something else we want to talk about in this session is the, the concept of a data model. Now, a data model is uh, very closely related to a data set, but it is, it's an abstract term. It's something that, that doesn't exist in, in real life, but things are data models. Now, what do we mean by a data model? A data model is something that can be queried by a user or a report. Now, those things can be queried using DAX or MDX, and we will talk in a moment about the real world things that are data models. But you might also hear people referring to semantic models, um, which I think are, are more or less the same thing. It's just a layer on top of your data where some modeling takes place and which allows you to build reports and run queries more easily. Right. So it leads us to the next definition about being a queryable resource that what is the type of query? And there's a special type of query called an analytic query, and it has these three phases of uh, filtering, grouping, and summarizing. In fact, when you look at any visual on a Power BI dashboard or a Power BI report, it has undergone at least two, if not three, of these phases. So what do we mean by this? So consider an example where I've got all of this data describing my company's sales activities, and there's thousands of rows of data, and I just need to answer a single question. What were the quarterly sales in 2021? Well, to answer the question, that data needs to be filtered, it needs to be grouped down to quarters, and it needs to be summarized, perhaps by summing the sales amounts together. So in this example, we could design a report with perhaps a slicer on the page to filter by the year, and that narrows down to a subset of data. Then we could choose a visual type, maybe like a column chart, which has groupings along the horizontal axis, and then the summarization by summing sales amounts together. This is what we mean by a model that is queried and how it's queried in Power BI. Now, as I said, there are, there are multiple kinds of things that can be data models. And in the world of Microsoft BI, there are, there are two kind of main flavors of model. There are tabular models, and tabular models are tabular because when you look at the way the data is modeled, it's modeled as a series of tables 
with relationships between them. Now, in Power BI, all models that you work with are tabular, or at least they appear to be tabular as well. Power BI datasets are always tabular models. You have analysis services tabular that is also tabular, uh, unsurprisingly, and Azure Analysis Services is also a form of tabular model. So where do we develop these tabular models? Well, for a Power BI developer, it is the free tool that you can download and install on any Windows machine being Power BI Desktop. So it is both a data modeling tool and a report authoring tool. So it's actually two tools together. And what I love about the reporting side is that often the report helps me validate my model design as I develop. But with a focus on the tabular model, as Chris has just introduced, the primary object is the table. And where do the tables come from? Well, the technology of Power Query, which is there to connect to a broad array of sources and to allow you to use a formula language to transform source data into the table of your heart's desire. All right, so we create these queries that when applied result in tables in the tabular model. And yet there's another approach um, which is that we can use DAX as an expression language to also add tables to our model. So there is your foundation of tables. Thus, why we call it a tabular model. Tables comprise columns. They can be calculated. Where you have multiple tables, you will have relationships to support filter propagation between them. For usability, we have hierarchies. Those hierarchies have levels that are just columns that allow navigation from high levels of granularity to lower levels, like year, quarter, month, today. And then lastly, that all important part where we summarize. Remember the analytic query filter groups and summarizes. Key to summarization is that measure, some expression that summarizes the data in the tabular model. So we, we just said that tabular models comprise of tables linked together with relationships, but they can't just be, well, they could just be any old collection of tables. Um, but in the world of Power BI and in BI in general, um, there is a particular way that you know, most people think that modeling should be done. And that's using a technique called dimensional modeling. In dimensional modeling, you have two different types of table. You have fact tables that contain information about transactions or activities, contains data that can be summarized. And you have dimensions which contain more information about the transactions or activities that are stored in the fact table. And because of the way that uh, the data gets modeled when you take this approach, uh, you tend to have one fact, one fact table surrounded by multiple dimension tables, and it looks like a star, which leaves us with something called a star schema. And here on the visual, you can see we've got a fact table called fact reseller sales, which contains sales transactions from resellers. And for every transaction logged in this fact reseller sales table, we know the dates, we know the product that was sold, we know the employee who did the selling, we know the reseller, we know the sales territory. These are the dimension tables around the side. Now, we don't have enough time to go into any detail about star schemas or dimensional modeling, but this concept is incredibly important to Power BI and not just for theoretical reasons, this is gonna be the key to your success with Power BI because so many people go wrong with Power BI because they do not model their data correctly. So understanding right. dimensional modeling is really important. Yeah, and so while this, theory, while this theory comes from relational data warehousing and BI developers that are potentially producing these massive and complex and, and year long projects to produce there is so much we can learn from this to optimize and produce useful models. So just to reinforce this point about the analytical query, those dimension tables are there for filtering and grouping and the fact tables are there for summarization. So there are other concepts we would like you to be aware of. And as Chris has well pointed out that this is not a session on star schema, but on your time, uh, we'd recommend that you also research topics like granularity, dimensionality, surrogate keys, uh, and also measures. And now might be a great time to also give a plug to the um, documentation that Microsoft have uh, when it comes to Power BI. So uh, for example, um, we're suggesting if you want to know about star schema that we have, I really need my glasses on because <laughs> I 
can't see. Um, I had preloaded this page and I just can't find it. We'll come back to it at the end of the session, but there is an article that talks specifically to Power BI developers and the essence of what you need to know about Star Schema to produce optimal models. All right, we'll come back to that link later on. So moving on to the next terminology that we would say is an important fundamental to know about data sets, um, I'll talk about fields. So field is one of those terms that you hear come up because we have a fields pane. But what we like to make clear is that the field is not really a modeling concept. It is a perspective of the model that is for report authors and how they map the resources of the model to the visual. So when you look at the fields pane, a column or in fact levels of a hierarchy and even measures are all collectively known as fields, right? So as data modelers, we do not talk about fields, but from a report consumption perspective, we do. So another important concept in the world of Power BI is the concept of a data flow. So a data flow is something that I find people often get confused with data sets. They say, well, when should I use a data flow? When should I use a data set? Well, the answer is fairly straightforward. If you are building a Power BI report, you always need a data set. There is no way of getting away from it. You have to have a data set. Now, the data set, as we will see in a moment, needs to get its data from somewhere. Usually, you're connecting to some external source like a relational database like SQL Server or maybe a CSV file or maybe an Excel file or something, but you need to get the data from somewhere. A data flow is just another data source. It's another place that a data set can get its data from. Right, and, and perhaps we'd say then it's carefully prepared data that is preparation for a data set. So as Chris has just described, there is a misconception there that some people think a report can query a data flow directly. And the fact is, this is not possible. So the only time a data flow becomes useful for a report is that someone has gone to the effort using a tool like Power BI Desktop, in fact, it's probably the only tool, to then go ahead and import from that data flow and potentially import from other sources as well to produce that beautiful, you know, useful, optimal star schema, whereupon the publication of that model back to the service produces a data set. And then what you'll see then is that the data flow is useful because the data set will periodically refresh from it. And then we see the report can query the data flow directly. All right, well, that brings us to the end of the very easy topics, the fundamentals of Power BI. Um, so we can now move on to the next section, which is that of hosting of models. So where can data sets, where can models live? So we've talked about data sets. Um, data sets live inside the Power BI service. So therefore we can talk about internal hosted models, data models that are inside Power BI. And a, a data set is always going to be inside the Power BI service. But, but its model may not be. So in this case, the model is actually hosted within the capacity of Power BI itself. Now, if we have internal hosted models, then it only speaks obviously that there must be external hosted models. And those two scenarios are in fact where that tabular model or not necessarily tabular model is hosted externally using a different service like Azure Analysis Services, which Chris has already said is tabular, but of course SQL Server Analysis Services that supports two different um, modeling technologies that Microsoft have developed. Um, of course, there's tabular, but the original, Chris can talk to it best because he's spoken and blogged about it for decades, is the multi-dimensional model also known as Cube. Um, and so when Power BI connects to these external models, which it certainly can do, it introduces a whole new term known as live connection. So let's take a look at an example here of the external hosted model. There's two scenarios. We've just mentioned that we could have a Power BI data set that points to also in the cloud and preferably in the same data center for uh, performance reasons, an Azure Analysis Services model or data set B in this case that points to the on-premises SQL Server Analysis Services, noting that the standard gateway must be installed in order for that communication to take place. So we've just introduced another term, so let's now tell you more about Live Connection. 
So you probably noticed that um, in Power BI Desktop, there, there, are, there are lots of different ways of working in Power BI Desktop, but you probably know that if you open up Power BI Desktop and you start to work, you can start to build a data set inside Power BI data, Desktop. And once you've built your data set, you can start to build reports in the same PBIX file. Alternatively, if you want, you can open up Power BI Desktop and you can connect to a data set or an external uh, model, Azure Analysis Services or on-prem analysis services. And then you don't have to build a data set inside Power BI Desktop. You don't need to do any modeling. The modeling has already taken place. You can just connect to the existing published data set in the Power BI service or analysis services, and you can start to build your own report. Now, in that situation, you may have noticed that in Power BI Desktop, it tells you you've got a live connection. That's where you've got a report and it's connected to a Power BI data set or an external model that isn't in the PBIX file you're working on. Mm. So this is a time where Microsoft, I think, have sort of overloaded the terminology. It means two different things, as Chris is saying. So it's either a report connection to a data set, or as we've already described, the data set is pointing to an external hosted model. So let's be very clear about this. The first scenario is a report authoring one, whereby the data set is already in the service, and yet you open up Power BI Desktop and you create a live connection. So in fact, we're connecting to what's known as a remote model, and we're going to talk about remote models later as well. This enables you to produce the most beautiful report you can imagine. And then when you're ready, you're going to publish that file so that the report then is also in the service, and then it just queries the data set in the service. Of course, the second scenario that we've already described, that a live connection can mean that the data set is pointing to an external model and that your report can query the data set, which really passes directly across to the, uh, in this case, Azure tabular model. Um, we'll speak very briefly about real-time analytics. Um, I know there was some interest in the survey earlier, and um, uh, we'll talk about what matters as far as the concept of a data set. So if you're not already f familiar with the fact that Power BI can deliver near real-time results in both dashboards and in reports, and so it does this because of some very special types of data sets. There's the streaming data set that is exclusively for dashboard streaming tiles. And it guarantees to present up to date, very fluid tiles in a dashboard. And yet there's a second type of real time dashboard, which is the push data set, which is very closely related to the import tabular model that we've already talked about. Um, however, they cannot be developed in Power BI Desktop. The two choices you have is in the Power BI service, you can create them, or you can, as a developer, use the Power BI API to programmatically create a push data set. The third type is actually the two together. It's both streaming and push at the same time that delivers uh, the benefits of both types as a single data set known as a hybrid data set. And so let's take a look then and use as review these three data sets that you might see in your data sets hub. The per capita sales is an internal hosted model. Now, this is what's interesting is that there's no icon or even descriptive label that tells you what type of data set is really in the Power BI service for you. So I just have to tell you that it's an internal hosted model. And the Finance Cube does suggest by its name that it's a cube, so it's multidimensional. So the only type of multidimensional model that Power BI supports directly, um, or for Microsoft anyway, is an external hosted model with a live connection to SQL Server Analysis Services. And then we have the call center and the FX rates and de device telemetry being those different types of real-time data sets. All right, so in my thinking, there are these five different possibilities of what your data set could be. There's one other topic quickly to talk about that real-time reporting is achieved through a property on a report page known as automatic page refresh. And when enabled, it can deliver uh, rapid refreshing of pages and automatic refreshing. Um, it is driven by a specific model framework that we're about to talk about because it requires direct query modeling to achieve that. So without spending any more time on real time, I love the topic so much so that um, the PM of real time, Miguel Martinez and myself have already produced a webinar 
And so we'll invite you to register and watch this webinar on demand. I include the URL here, but just to let you know, we'll share the URLs with you at the end and make it possible for you to download this presentation that has the URLs as well. Okay, so enough on real time at this stage, but let's get to the topic where Chris and I spent probably the most time developing this content in reflection with that customers and uh, people that we know have the most difficulty understanding the concepts about model frameworks themselves. Table storage mode. So we've talked about data sets, we've talked about models, and we've said that every time you have to have a report, it has to get its data from somewhere, from a model, which could be a Power BI data set. Now, if we think about Power BI data sets, where do they get their data from? How do they store their data? There are basically three options, two main options, and one which is a combination of the others. They are import mode and direct query mode, and dual, which basically means both import or direct query mode. So import means literally, remember this is a table property, the table loads the data, it is stored in the table. Direct query says, leave the data in the data source and the table will query the data when it needs it. And as Chris has mentioned, dual could mean that you can't make up your mind. <laughs> Why not have both of them at the same time and let Power BI determine what is the most optimal for the query, the analytic query that it needs to send to the model. We'll be talking about dual in an optimization topic, but let's focus then on import because if every table in your model is an import storage table, then we call the entire model an import model. All right, it is in fact the most frequently developed model and for good reasons that we'll share with you in a moment. So let's consider by example that, and watch the way this star is growing as more and more data from different data sources and different data formats indeed, can be imported to contribute to that model. Now, to do this, you don't have to work very hard because in fact, the defaults are that when you connect to a data source type in Power BI Desktop, and if there's a choice of connectivity mode, that it will almost always default to import for very good reasons, because there are huge benefits associated with import model design. The first is it provides you as a data modeler the best flexibility and choice because all data sources support this. And therefore, we can also integrate data from multiple sources within the one model, which is a very powerful technique for bringing different data together for the purposes of a single report. There is no limitation on the DAX functions, nor indeed the power query functions that you can use to prepare your model. There's support for calculated tables and almost always it's going to deliver the fastest possible performance. And why? It's because when data is imported and loaded into tables, it is compressed and it is also optimized and indexed for the fastest possible filtering, grouping and summarization at query time. But there are always some limitations, aren't there? Well, <laughs> in import mode, your data is held in an in-memory column in a database format. And because that data is held in memory, there have to be limits on how much data you can work with. That varies depending on whether you're using Power BI shared capacity or Power BI premium, but the general restriction you have is about one gigabyte of compressed data in memory. So you can't load all of the data you want. There will be a limit. The second main limitation is that if you're copying the data from your source into your data set, and the data in your source changes, well, you have to copy that data all over again. So you will need to refresh your data set to get the latest version of the data. And that means that if your data is out of date, well, you know, you may not be making your decisions based on the most recent data. That isn't usually a problem, but you've got to get that data. And of course, getting that data, copying the data could take some time. And of course, that might take hours and hours if you have really large amounts of data or you have a very slow data source. And by default, as the slide says, but data, data sets will, when you refresh a data set, you're going to copy all of the data from the data source. Now we have something called incremental refresh, which for certain sources means that you can try and only reload the data that might have changed, but you know, that's something you will need to set up and that's not something that's easy to do on all sources. 
but generally you'll find that the benefits outweigh the limitations for import modeling. Okay, so Absolutely. most models, if, if indeed all models that you're likely to develop might use import mode. But the other end of the spectrum is that a direct query model is defined by the fact that all tables in that model use a direct query connection to a single source group. And source group is a term that we're about to introduce, so let's come to that in a moment. But in this model design, imagine that we still have a star schema, still have a tabular model, but it has a single connection to, in this case, an Azure SQL database. And therefore, what happens is that when a Power BI report uses this data set and the visuals query the model, well, those queries are sent and passed through down to the Azure SQL database. There are enormous benefits to this in particular circumstances. So first of all, note that when you connect to a data source that supports direct query mode, typically it's a relational product, is that you need to explicitly make that decision and connect using direct query mode. And you're likely to do it because the volumes of data that you have are simply too large or impractical to import and refresh within your model. So think about a data warehouse that could represent terabytes of data, forget even attempting to import it, use direct query instead. And the beautiful thing about this is that not only can we manage large volumes of data, but we don't need to refresh it because it will always be, de be delivering the latest data, potentially near real time results of what's going on in that source system. There's also another exciting concept that is relatively new and still in preview is that beyond direct query to relational databases like Oracle and SQL and Teradata is that we've now got the ability to direct query to a Power BI data set itself. And we'll talk about that concept shortly, but I think that what we might be alluding to is a supermodel, Chris, right? Wasn't it? Was that <laughs> direct query to a Power BI data set allows us to create and extend other data sets by creating new data sets. Absolutely, which is incredibly powerful. Now, all these things sound amazing. Why would I ever want to use import <laughs> mode when I've got direct query mode? Because import mode has all these restrictions. Direct query mode sounds great. It, it gets rid of all these restrictions. Well, there are always, always going to be limitations. And the limitations in direct query mode are ones you really need to think carefully about. First of all, you cannot use direct query mode with all data sources. You can only use direct query mode with data sources that have some concept of a query language and one that Power BI can actually speak. So for example, you can't do direct query mode on a CSV file because there is no way of querying a CSV file. It's just a file. You can direct query against SQL Server because SQL Server can be queried in SQL and Power BI can generate SQL queries. There are other limitations too. The Power Query Editor window, it can be used to do some transformations of data, but it can't do lots of complex transformations because again, the only transformations you can do in the Power Query Editor are ones that can be translated back to the source that you're working with, the query language of the source you're working with. The next limitation is perhaps the most important one. It is that direct query mode can be slow. Now, that doesn't mean it is always slow with a bit of careful tuning. Uh, and if you are fairly restrictive with your scenarios, then yes, you can make direct query mode perform really well, but it is very easy much easier than with import mode to end up with slow reports. And then the last thing to mention is that if you're running a report and Power BI is generating all of these SQL queries against your relational data source, and your relational data source is actually a transactional system like an ERP system or a CRM system, those SQL queries can slow down the data source and prevent it from doing the things that it's meant to be doing during the day. You don't want your ERP system to be brought down because somebody ran lots and lots of um, Power BI reports on top of it. So you have to be very careful with this. You could end up with a very unhappy DBA. And so while the DBA might have granted you read privileges because they understand that you're building Power BI models, their understanding is that you're periodically 
and perhaps infrequently importing data from their source system. Um, it would become a big surprise to them to understand that a very popular report that you distributed to everybody in the organization is an entirely different workload that um, the database was not resourced for nor was optimized for. So it's actually a courtesy um, if you are going to build a direct query model that you collaborate with that database owner and you work together to produce an optimal solution. Awesome. Okay, well, that brings us to the definition that we did sort of introduce before because we said a direct query model had a single source group to a single direct query connection. Now, therefore, what is a source group? And it really is a set of model tables that are related to a single source, but there are two types of source group. There is a source group that represents all imported data, including calculated tables. And then for each direct query connection that you have, there, there must be one source group. Um, you may be familiar with this term already, but it used to be called Data Island, but documentation at Microsoft have recently relabeled it. So what does this mean? It means that a model can have multiple source groups. So in this case, we could have an import source group that stores all of our external data that is loaded into tables. And for some other tables, they are belonging to a direct query source group and they do their live querying down to the Azure SQL database. So that brings us to the term of what we're now calling a composite model, that a composite model has more than one source group, as was just described. And so it's probably time to see a real world example now. And in fact, this is taken from uh, one of my customers' projects with their permission. Uh, this is the model view of a reasonably simple model, but what should stand out is that two of the tables um, are white and three of the tables have a blue line across the top. And what the line is indicating to us is their membership of a source group. Um, now, arguably, the date and journal tables um, have a white stripe. That's the way I like to think about it. Okay, but if we hover the cursor over one of those tables, the tooltip reveals that it is using a storage mode of import. So if you see no line or a white line across the top, it's import. If you hover the cursor over one of the other tables, you'll see that it is a storage mode of direct query. And then we get to see the details of the source group, in this case, connecting to a SQL database at a particular Azure address. All right, so here is a design of a composite model. Now, it leads us to another definition, which is somewhat confusing. And, and Chris, I'll let you dispel that confusion. <laughs> So if you've been working in Power BI Desktop, you've probably, as I mentioned earlier, looked at the bottom right hand corner of the screen and it will tell you the mode you're in. And by default, if you're using import mode for everything, you see nothing there. That means that everything is in import mode. But you may also see some other messages there. And what these messages mean, well, they, it can be a little bit confusing sometimes. So what we've got here with this table is something that explains what all of those messages means. So if you see in the bottom right hand corner the message that you have a live connection, all you know is that in Power BI Desktop, there is no data set you're, being, you're designing. You are connected to uh, a Power BI data set published to the service or an analysis services data model. Um, and that could be direct query mode, that could be import mode, we don't know. We don't know how many source groups there are. All we know is that we are connecting to a data model somewhere else. If you see nothing, as I said, that tells you that you have a data set in your PBIX file, and that is in import mode. Okay, if which means have, every table is in import storage yes, mode. Yes, every table is in import storage mode. If you see direct query, well, um, it's a little bit confusing. <laughs> because it means that the, the data set that you're working on in Power BI Desktop, it could be pure direct query, or it could be a composite model. And it could be more than one source group as well. And then- So what it's telling us is that every table is in direct query storage query mode, mode, but there could be multiple direct query connections is the point yes. here. So composite right. would say that there are perhaps two source groups, one to an Oracle direct query and one to a SQL Server direct query. And then Whereas, when Power BI Desktop says mixed mode, it says that the table storage modes are import and direct query in the same model, which means, well, we know we're guaranteed there's an import source group and one direct query source group, but possibly more direct query source group. So um, 
Chris and I put this together and it took us a little while to work it out and we thought really it's not that important to actually know. Um, although it's just a bit of conflicting information because Power BI Desktop has a different concept of informing you of what your model is like and yet analysis services and you know it's um, mature technology stack has a very different concept about describing frameworks. So don't get too hung up on it. Um, we think the stronger takeaway is model framework. Don't, don't memorize Power BI desktop mode. If you're doing an exam for Microsoft on Power BI, I doubt they would be testing Power BI desktop mode, but they most certainly would be testing framework. So back to this model. Chris, help me out. How many source groups? Do well, we I can see two different colors along the top of those tables. So there must be two different source groups there. Absolutely. What's the model framework? Well, because there are two different source groups and one of them is white, we must have a composite model. So there's going to be, but well, actually that's not true, but yes, there are two different colors that's got to be a composite model. Yeah, so what matters is a composite means you've got more than one source group. So Chris is right. The fact that we see white and blue, two source groups. And the fact I have to think about this shows how complicated and confusing <laughs> it can be. And he does it every day for his job. Uh, what's the desktop mode? Well, that has got to be mixed because we've got some import and we've got some direct query. How many data sources? Well, there's one direct query source group there. So that's one data source. And then we've got two tables in import mode, which could be the same source as the direct query data source. They could be two different ones they could be one different one um it depends it does depend in fact the diagram doesn't give you enough information the only way to answer the question is to open up the power query editor and to look at the journal and date queries and then backtrack because they might be dependent on other queries so the answer is there could be one two three four five six we don't know okay uh we know at minimum there's one and in fact the answer is one and it might surprise you that why would you build a model of the same data source, but import some of its data and use direct query for another part. Um, as I said earlier, this is actually a real example I've done with a customer and it's simplistic reporting over their general ledger transactions. The journal table in this instance stores all of the actual transactions that have been posted to the general ledgers in the day-to-day -day accounting activities. And yet, as the other table names allude that there are forecasting and budgeting scenarios. Now, what happens is that they like to meddle with those numbers from time to time and adjust and revise their forecasts. And what they want to see is that when they adjust the forecast, they want to see in Power BI immediately, without having to refresh the model, they want to see what the forecast looks like against the actuals. So this is actually a balanced architecture that brings together you know, the amazing capability of table storage mode to say that these tables need to deliver real-time data and these tables deliver periodically imported data all right so that's why it's actually a single data source driving this design so now let's introduce another concept the concept of local models and remote models now this is something perhaps that that is did we make this up piece or i don't think so i think it it, it, it exists as a concept but a local model is either the model that you are developing in Power BI Desktop, when you are developing a model in Power BI Desktop, or it could be a relative term connected to this idea that we talked about earlier of direct query to Power BI datasets. Because if you have a dataset that in turn connects to another dataset through direct query, then there is one dataset connecting to another, and the, the dataset that is the one that is doing the querying of the other data set could be thought of as the local model. And if you have a local model, that then suggests you have a remote model, a model that is somewhere you are connecting to. Right, and indeed that's the case. So it's really a proximity thing, like is the model near or far in a way? And we already talked about live connection when developing a report. That live connection, remember the model is not in desktop, you're connecting to it and it's considered to be remote. Now, the reason that these terminologies are becoming now important 
is because of this new concept of the super model, right? That this new preview capability that a Power BI data set is now also a potential direct query source for a new model. So let's provide you a scenario here at the company. They've got this core model. Um, the model is in fact a single version of analytic truth connecting to their Azure Synapse Analytics data warehouse, right? And it doesn't matter, but it's a direct query model. Now, the fact is a business analyst has been tasked with building a report for their manager that is sales per capita. And the business analyst connects to the core model using a live connection, so it's a remote model, and he's looking for population and for calculations that are sales per capita. He needs population by uh, country. And the fact is the core model doesn't store population. So this new preview capability allows that business analyst to switch the live connection into a direct query model. And literally it copies the schema of the data set into a local model in Power BI Desktop. And that opens up enormous potential that the model can be personalized now. It can be renamed, things can be hidden, new calculations can be added, new source groups can be added to extend that model. So look at this. The business analyst finds some great data that represents population and he's satisfied that this is good quality data, imports it, thereby adding a second source group to the local model, which is import. And then he's able to create a relationship that integrates at model level those tables. This new model locally can be published, resulting in a new data set that we're going to call a specialized model. And look at what happens when he publishes the report on sales per capita, that Power BI queries the specialized model and some of the data, the population values are stored internally, but for the other data, a direct query is used to connect to the remote model and complete the query result. This is what I think we were suggesting is the new supermodel when it comes to Power BI. What do you think, Chris? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I should point out that supermodel is definitely not a Microsoft term. That's something, <laughs> that's something but we've it's a made term up. That we, we would think many will embrace when they understand the potential, because think about it. The business analyst that had the problem of reporting on sales per capita and when the core model didn't have population, with the current tool set, he has no choice but to develop the model from scratch and create multiple versions of the truth in doing so. And here he's managed to avoid it with relative simplicity and ease. Absolutely. Now, this is where remote and local start to make sense because what you can achieve is you can have a chain of models. Microsoft will allow up to three data sets to be chained in this way. So data set C can direct query to B and data set B can direct query to A. So to reinforce what we've said about local and remote, consider report B that queries data set B, data set C has no relevance, but data set B is local from the perspective of report B and data set A is remote. And then if we have report C that connects and queries data set C, well, this data set is local and a and B are remote. So it's a relative term within the chain of where is that model. In this case, what are we saying? Upstream models are always remote. So many, many different topics that are cover on frameworks. The important takeaway is table storage mode delivers you enormous flexibility under the right circumstances to determine table by table, will it import or direct query or as we'll come to, possibly both at the same time. Okay, so let's go one level deeper. We know that a tabular model contains tables and relationships. The next thing to talk about is the fact that a table can be broken up into multiple partitions. And a partition is a refreshable object that stores a model table's data. If you have a table, it will always have at least one partition, but you can create multiple partitions if you want. There are a couple of different ways of doing it. If you use Power BI's incremental refresh functionality, that automatically creates and manages multiple partitions inside your fact tables. Uh, but you can also go in and build partitions manually using tools like uh, tabular editor, for example. 
typically so, what you sorry so so i'll just i'll just uh fill in some theory and then i'll let chris talk to that point so just to make it very very clear remember this object diagram our partitions sit in here and not for calculated tables but only for tables with import storage mode right so um, to the point is that every import table does in fact have a single partition automatically. But what Chris is now referring to is that you can create multiple partitions, for example. So here, for example, we are in SQL Server Management Studio, which is another tool that can be used to create and view partitions on a table. Uh, this is a published Power BI data set um, accessed through um, the XMLA endpoint feature for Power BI Premium. Uh, that makes Power BI look like analysis services. So I can use tools like SQL Server Management Studio to connect. And you can see here that the internet sales table has three partitions in it. Now, typically when you create a partition, you create, a, you create all partitions, they're filtered by time slices. And in this case, I've got one partition for the year 2021, one for the year 2022, and one for the year 2023. What's the golden rule? We had a minimum number of rows before you would really consider partitioning. And I think 2,216 is probably a very small yes, number, but probably not. I think it's something, it's it's within the, what, the millions, 10 million or something, right? Before you think that deserves its own partition. Is, is there some rule of thumb, Chris? Um, it depends a lot. I mean, I would certainly not create part, recommend creating partitions if you've only got 2,000 rows. You should <laughs> probably only think about partitioning once you've got at least a couple of million rows in Power BI, maybe even more. But it depends on how quickly and how regularly you want to refresh your um, your table or the partitions inside your table. Right, because that's key, is that you're, you're introducing a partition strategy to allow refresh to happen as quickly as possible and to minimize impact on the source system. Now, beneath the covers, and Chris was mentioning tabular editor. So when you look at the partition using a tool like this, um, this reveals the secret of how it happens because you've got some filter in here that says, for that 2021 partition, um, ensure that it only ever imports data from you know, that time slice. All right, so that leads us to a very new definition. Uh, so new, in fact, that it's a coming soon feature and not even available to us in preview, but the announcement is enormously exciting uh, because the concept of a hybrid table now opens up to the point that, that what you understand as table storage mode shifts to become partition storage mode, meaning that a table can comprise partitions of different stores. They could be import or direct query. And just as one example here, think about the enormous potential of delivering real-time rapid responses because most of your history has already been imported and we're satisfied that it will rarely change. So we don't need to import it again or infrequently. And yet the latest time slice could be direct query, meaning that if somebody is querying the very latest data, it will hit the source system. It might be a little slow, but overall this table is now a balanced architecture in terms of partitions. All right, so I just think this is huge. The fact that we've got this degree of control as data modelers to say that a single table can use different storage modes. It's like we've never had this before, Chris, is that right? Not in uh, Power BI. Uh, if we go back a long time to analysis services, multidimensional, we could do this. Um, well, multidimensional has done 20 this years for ago, 16 but... years. And, and it's, it has the concept of, uh, what do we call them, uh, measure groups. And uh, uh, sorry, is it measure groups? Now I'm confused. Uh, as in that the, the um, we could use roll app or mole app. So it really is yeah. now the equivalent of what multidimensional has provided us for over a decade is now coming to tabular. So something else to mention, um, we talked about direct query mode and import mode earlier. Uh, there is this third option called dual storage mode. It isn't really a, a third separate storage mode. It's just the ability for a table in Power BI to switch between import mode and direct query mode, depending on what the situation requires. You know, if there are going to be some cases where when you have a composite model, uh, a table needs to be in import mode, some in direct query mode. Right, so looking at the same model, an improvement has been done. And uh, 
you might notice that now we have striped lines within the direct query source group, right? So the striped line is indicating to us and is confirmed through the tooltip that it is a dual storage, that the account table, the scenario table, and the date table are all import and direct query at the same time. Now, this opens up enormous potential, but before we go there, let's just understand that nothing has really changed. There are still two source groups. It's still a composite model. It's still in mixed mode, and there's just still one source. But the only change is that three tables are now import or direct query. Um, notably, they're dimension tables, all right? And we'll come to that in a moment. But let's consider what this means when a Power BI visual queries the model. And so what you'll see here is that this visual is current financial year expenses. So that implies that there is a filter on the visual using the date table. The grouping is using the account table and the summarization is coming from the journal table because these are actual values. In this instance, look at this, the only three tables the visual needs are date, journal and account. And therefore, the dual tables will behave as import for this reason, because this visual can be satisfied without needing to connect to the direct query source. Power BI will always choose the most efficient and fastest path to retrieve the data, which is import. Now, things change with this second visual, because this time you'll notice that there's a filter not just on date financial year, but also on scenario forecast. And that means that it's going to be querying the facts in the scenario amount fact table. Right. This time, it's going to use direct query source group. And so those dual tables will switch to direct query mode. And it's almost certain that Power BI would construct a single select statement that would join these tables together, apply the appropriate filters and summarization to produce this result. Now, what's intriguing is a third visual brings together actuals and forecasts at the same time. And so in this case, Power BI is actually forced to use both source groups and it will combine the results of those independent source group queries to produce a final result. And it will do this, Chris, is it correct? The formula engine will bring them together um, to deliver a single query result back to Power BI. Correct. Mm. So, an extraordinary um, architecture here that, that allows direct querying to be um, sometimes convert to import if it can. Um, note the pattern here is that the fact table is in direct query, presumably a massive amount of data impractical to import, but the related dimension tables provide flexibility to Power BI. And think about it also that if you had a slicer based on the date table, a slicer is only querying the one table. It can do that very quickly with import. But the moment that it needs to filter a direct query fact table, it is used to join and filter on the source system. And then the last big concept to introduce is that of aggregations. Now, if we're working with large amounts of data in direct query mode, as we've said, performance can be an issue because of course, not only do you have to send a query back to the data source, that data source has to go away and read the data and typically aggregate it up to the level that you want to see it in uh, your Power BI report. And that can take a long time if you're working with large amounts of data. So what we have in Power BI is something called an aggregation. An aggregation is just a trick that we've used in BI since the beginning of time, which is, why bother aggregating the data when your query runs when you can pre-aggregate your data somewhere when you're loading your data and then use that pre-aggregated data when the time comes to run your report. So what we've got here is a fairly simple model. We've got a fact table called internet sales and dimension tables called product and date. Now, if we were just using the internet sales fact table, we could run queries using anything selected from product or date. But we've also got an extra table here called internet sales aggregation. This is another table inside my data set, but it's a special table which has been marked as an aggregation. As you can see, it's only got the order date column on it and it's only got the sales amount aggregated column. So what we've got is data pre-aggregated up to the order date level uh, by sales amount. 
And if you go through the uh, manage aggregations dialog in Power BI Desktop, this is what you'll see. This is where it's specifying that this table is contains pre-aggregated data. It's pre-aggregated data from the internet sales table. So if somebody runs a query, uh, or builds a visual inside your Power BI report, and if all they're doing is grouping by the date key from the date dimension table, and they are looking at the sum of the internet sales table, then the query can be redirected to the aggregation table and reuse those pre-aggregated values there. Therefore, the query and the report and the visual will be much, much faster. Right, so let, let's apply that to a couple of examples. So in this model, and by the way, Chris has mentioned that when you manage aggregations, that table is hidden and not just visible hidden it is permanently hidden it cannot be used even by dax formula or row level security it is used internally when power bi can detect and redirect the query to use it as a as a more efficient path so as an optimization look at what would happen here with a visual that is current year sales by product color okay when grouping by product color we can see the product table is a direct query table right so it's going to satisfy this uh with three tables in fact it will use the direct query source group and go down to the source system to do this the aggregation table plays no role because the and let's use those star schema terminologies the dimensionality and granularity of that aggregation table have nothing to do with product or color but should we be lucky enough to have a visual that says just grouping by month what were the total internet sales well in this case the query can be satisfied by the dual date table and the imported aggregations that the aggregation table will provide a very, very fast response over um, instead of using the internet sales direct query. So the takeaway here is that when you're using direct query fact tables, you can boost the query performance by using pre-aggregated results. And the other takeaway too is that that aggregation table doesn't need to be an import table as it is in this case. Your aggregation table can also be direct query, implying that your source system has a, a source of summarized data, maybe a materialized view in Azure Synapse Analytics that has been built specifically to boost the performance of these types of queries. Uh, there is one question, uh, Peter. How is Pre-aggregation different from OLAP, or is it, or is it achieving the same? That's a Chris OLAP question. question. OLAP, Chris question. <laughs> okay, sorry. It depends on what you mean by OLAP. If you mean analysis services multidimensional, then yes, that does have the concept of aggregations, and it's very, very similar. All right, so that leads us to also a new coming soon feature again just announced and only available for Power BI Premium is that there will be a switch you can turn on and you can tell Power BI to detect and automatically generate aggregations based on usage patterns of queries. All right, so um, while you can explicitly design your model for aggregations, stay tuned for a new capability that will auto detect and create them on the fly. All right, there's one other topic in optimizations, and that is uh, also a premium feature, uh, is that query caching is another thing that can boost query performance. It's not a modeling technique, but it's a data set setting that says for Power BI, when you detect repetition of query, um, then cache the query result and share it across multiple users. All right. Um, how are we going for time? Um, because uh, I just want to make sure that we're not going over. over and I, and I how are we doing, are we doing for, time? for time? I think we've gone an hour. So, so how about, how about we, finish we finish on the refresh topic, Chris, and then we can uh, wrap up with any final questions. Fair enough. So we've talked about import mode, and we talked about the fact that you need to bring data into your tables in import mode. That process of copying the data from the source into or import mode tables is called refresh. Now, refresh can be done on demand. You can go into Power BI, into the service, click a button, and then refresh your data sets, or it can be scheduled. So you can go into Power BI and also say, I want to refresh my data set every day at nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, refresh operations can also be triggered from outside the Power BI service through an API. There is a Power BI REST API that allows you to refresh. Uh, there is also a Power Automate connector that allows you to uh, trigger that refresh API. And also you can go through the XMLA endpoint, which I mentioned earlier, 
which is something that allows Power BI to appear like an instance of an Azure Analysis Services. And other tools like SQL Management Studio can then be used to connect to Power BI and do things like refresh data sets. So remember, this is one of the limitations of import modeling. While import modeling has many strengths, this is its weakness, is that you must ensure that the data is refreshed. And my saying to my customers is, your model is only as current as the last successful refresh that took place. Uh, because sometimes refresh can be brittle and fragile, that if somebody changes permissions or renames a file, is that refresh can fall over. And one other thing I've, I've found that's very annoying when you have multiple sources is that it just takes one table to fail and the whole import refresh fails, right? So, um, Refresh is a really important topic to get right for your import tables. Um, Chris had mentioned earlier with partitions that um, that you could uh, set up an incremental refresh. Now, this is in fact a feature of Power BI, incremental refresh, that it simplifies partition management on your behalf to provide you efficient refresh of import tables, especially large fact tables, such that it doesn't need to remove and reload all history, um, that it can manage based on time slices, um, just partitioning are just partitioning and refreshing the partitions that need to be updated. Uh, I'll talk about this one. It's a property on a data set. Uh, I'll keep it brief because I've noticed not a lot of people are using dashboards in Power BI, but it's important to understand that the architecture of dashboards is very different to reports. The dashboards and the tiles you see on a dashboard actually rely on cached information. See, the dashboard guarantees giving you the latest data as quickly as possible. But what does this mean if your data set is direct query or live connection to an external hosted model? Is that the dashboard caching doesn't really know when the data has changed, it's outside its control. So therefore there's a property on the data set that says how frequently will dashboard caches be updated, anywhere between 15 minutes and weekly. And this allows you to control the right balance for keeping those dashboard caches up to date. Uh, let me talk to this one. Um, gateways are an important concept during refresh, but they're also important for live connection and direct query should your sources remain on premises. So the two gateways being personal and standard. Personal, of course, is just on the desktop, uh, but standard is something that would be set up by gateway administrators in your IT group. But let's be clear about the two purposes of gateways. So we've just talked about refresh and so that when you've got import tables or partitions and the data resides on premises, you will need the gateway to support that secure communication from Power BI to the data. But the gateway serves a secondary purpose for live connections to external hosted models. So that's SQL Server Analysis Services and for direct query connections to on-premises like SQL Server or Oracle. Um, gateways have data sources. So um, for standard gateway, those data sources need to be predefined in terms of the data source type and in terms of the connection details and the credentials that would be used by the gateway to authenticate with those sources. Um, so that brings us to security, but perhaps uh, we're running a little out of time. So um, what we've been doing is we've been saying, well, this presentation is completely downloadable. We'd like you to think that it's like a dictionary or a glossary of all terms related to data sets. Um, and so you'll find that many of those terms are fully self-explanatory in the remainder of the presentation. Um, and if you do want to see Chris and I talk through the presentation perhaps way too quickly, well, that's where we can share with you now um, the link to the webinar that we did uh, with Microsoft. All right. So in conclusion, what we'll share with you is that uh, the inspiration behind this presentation and a lot of hours of work, wasn't it, Chris, actually putting Absolutely. these terms together and debating amongst ourselves and others um, was for a Microsoft webinar. And so when you download the presentation, you can click on the registration link and you can get access to the on-demand uh, complete presentation of all terms. And then beyond that, because we acknowledge that we've just scratched the surface, right? We've talked about star schema in what, less than a minute? And yet that topic could well deserve a full day's explanation to really understand the important concepts. Now, at Microsoft, they go to a great effort to keep a great set of content up to date and current about Power BI. So you'll find two sets. There's the Power BI documentation about all the products and features. Uh, but the guidance section is um, really the input from Chris's team, which is the customer advisory team at Microsoft. 
And so they work very closely with customers and they learn about pain points. And so to help other customers avoid them, we document the findings. And so the guidance section is well worth taking a look at. Let me go ahead and put my glasses on and find what I had set up ready to present. And we are here. So this is what the guidance docs look like at Microsoft. And um, we've been talking about data sets. So what you'll find is there's a data, data modeling section. Um, data sets and data models are sort of the same thing, aren't they, Chris? <laughs> uh, maybe. Not necessarily. And our fundamentals said this, a, a model as a tabular model is one concept, but your data set isn't necessarily a model. And there are a few exceptions to that, like a streaming data set is not a model. So therefore a data set is not usually um, synonymous with a model. Anyway, the point is, if you come to the data modeling section on the left or here, in fact, what's the culture code for Turkey? TR. TR. Let's see what it looks like in Turkish. There we go. I'm going to guess this is a star schema here. Am I right, Halil? Uh, yes. Uh, no. Awesome. So look at this. It's even in your native language. But <laughs> all of those important concepts about star schema are all covered it, here. It was um, the previous link. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so which one? Oh, this is data reduction. OK, so yes. this one here is star schema. I was going to say, where is that yellow star? There it is here. So. This is a great starting point for you. Now that you understand what these terms are and their relevance and hearing Chris and I stress their importance, then come here, read about Star Schema. For import modeling, this was the second article that I wrote for Microsoft and it really was about what are all of the techniques I can do to ensure that my import model is as small as possible. That means that the refreshes will be faster, the impact on source systems will be less and over time, that model can grow um, without me needing to consider uh, doing things because it's grown too large, let that one gigabyte size limit, right? So I'll leave you to follow through with um, documentation and especially the guidance documentation on data modeling. Um, a very, very quick training plug, this is the only marketing today, is that I do offer um, consulting mentoring services, but also training in Power BI. Um, I offer training really on a classroom level. So if there's any interest virtually for online training on Power BI, feel free to reach out to me. But otherwise, that brings us to the end of the presentation and we would encourage you and you are welcome to download the entire presentation. Uh, you can do it with uh, the QR code or I'm going to copy into the chat window now a whole series of links um, that will let you uh, download and also access some key resources we talked about today. Um, are there any questions, Halil, that you might like to read out to us? Yeah, there, there is one question. I, th I think it is related to previous question about OLAP. Uh, where is it? Uh, sorry. I think it was deleted. It disappeared. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it was about uh, publishing is publishing multidimensional models Power BI possible in the future? I, I think no. Or no, um, it's something that we have discussed, um, but we have no plans to do it at the moment. So, so if I heard that correctly, was that will Power BI natively support multidimensional models, internal models that are multidimensional? That was the question I answered, yes. Wow, okay. I've got to say, um, that was my original skill set was to build cubes. I haven't built a cube for years. <laughs> and I don't I haven't built a cube I... for a while as well. So I'd be surprised that Microsoft would be investing in this because I think uh, we're seeing the customers embrace Tabula and Tabula is doing a fairly good job of um, addressing many business needs. And when you see new features like, you know, aggregations and hybrid tables and stuff, it's like, I got to say, for the models that I'm building, um, I'm not missing multidimensional. Some people do. Some people do. <laughs> there's, awful, there's an awful lot of um, legacy multidimensional out there as well. A lot of legacy. Yeah, but that's okay. But new models, uh, is it is it causing difficulty for customers saying, but we really need these cube capabilities? I, I don't think so. I don't think there are, there are many people building new models. Anyway, our answer is that there are, there's a set of um, templates for uh, building um, 
for, for putting analysis services multidimensional on VMs, and that's our answer for moving multidimensional to the cloud. Right. So it's always at this stage, it's an external hosted capability. So yeah, you'll need exactly. either on-prem or VM, install SQL Server Analysis Services, have the standard gateway, and then you can do live connections to it. Um, one thing that I've been caught out with a customer is that they cannot create DAX measures in their reports when <coughs> using multidimensional as their source. Um, and that's, that's a pain point that they can't build custom measures. They have to be inside that queue. All right. Well, if there are no further questions, Chris, how would you like to sign off on today's session? Uh, well, thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure. Um, mm -hmm. I know Istanbul is on my list of places to visit, and hopefully when things are a little bit better, I'll be able to come and visit you and maybe present in person. Be, be our guest next summer, definitely. <laughs> it will be our pleasure to host you, to walk around with you in Istanbul, in, in Antalya, anywhere you want. It's such a beautiful city. I just have great memories of visits to Istanbul. And Chris, you have to do the hammams. <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> okay, I know the best places to visit. Uh, please bring me when you decide to come. I will do. I will do. Okay, uh, one question from me to, to Chris. Could you please tell Power BI developer team to slow down a bit so we can all catch up? <laughs> There is there is no chance of that happening. It will just get faster and faster. Wow. They're releasing too many features in a very short period of time. No one can, can consume. I'm lagging I, behind. Do you want me to tell you some something for nothing? Let me put a link in the chat. Something that hasn't been announced, but it's publicly available, is the latest release notes uh, for Power BI. So if you want to see what is coming in the future. Uh, this is the 2021 release plan wave one uh, with all of the, the next set of uh, Power BI features that have been, um, that are planned for September and uh, later this year. So how little your dream will not come true, unfortunately, they're not listening, so. You want the opposite of the ideas.powerbi.com, Halil, is it? It's like, or you want to constrain the rate of new ideas and therefore the output of new features. So uh, anything uh, that stands out, Chris, that um, is uh, uh, so of note? Actually, is this the right one? Um, I know we're due for a new release, but anyway, automatic aggregations are on there. Um, I tell the lie. Is it the new one? Well, I I'm a Power Query fan, so this I always was updated go to a be... month ago. So um, uh, uh, maybe there are maybe key dates for 2021. Yeah, there are key dates for 2021. Maybe I tell a lie. Maybe it's the the new one hasn't been released yet, but it is due any day. Sometimes All right, so stay tuned. Bit. There's going to be a whole series yes. of uh, new public announcements about what's coming. So, uh, Halil, check. I'm, I'm afraid there's less sleep for you as you keep up with the current news on Power BI. But actually, I'm very happy with the improvements, with everything. The team is amazing, plus community. Right, and, and I think that what really spells out, and the marketing people love to say this, is the magic quadrant at, uh, at from Gartner that basically says, hey, look, uh, even even the second place of Tableau, it, you know, Microsoft is a breakaway with Power BI. <laughs> uh, no, truly, it, it's just when you look at the, if you were to animate over time the magic quadrant, but to see that Power BI as a leader and its ability to execute on what it promises is, um, is uh, fantastic. And what that suggests to people here on the audience today is that if you invest in Power BI skills, they're not going to go away. If you can learn all this hard, tricky stuff and become an expert on data modeling and data sets in Power BI, these are going to be valuable skills that will carry out throughout your career. I am assured of that. And as Chris might attest as well, that we've worked in this space for well over 20 years, is that you know these are mature technologies that are being embraced and used um, now and into the future. So there's our word of encouragement. Okay, any further question from the audience? Thank you, Abhi, now for pasting the link for release plan Q3. Uh, I 
think we have no further question. Chris Webb is typing something, <laughs> it says. No, I'm not. Oh, there is another Chris Webb then. There's two Chris Webbs. It says Chris Teams doesn't lie, Chris. It's typing. I think I think that means so that it might it might mean that I can now go back to bed. It's 4 30 in the <laughs> yes, morning I here think. in Melbourne. So um I'll thank you for your time and interest in attendance and um and wish you all the very best with your Power BI data set adventures. Yes. Make sure Thanks you have a lot. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. Uh, especially Peter. I didn't know it was that late in your country. Thanks a lot. It was a great uh, event as usual. Hope to see you soon again. Thank you again. Thanks a lot. Good night or good evening, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks a lot.